Okay, it's one o'clock. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our workshop today. I'm Karen Price, co-director of the FN's Family Support Program and project director of the Parent Training and Information Center. All of our workshops, including the previous ones, are recorded and can be watched on our VFN YouTube channel. The link is on our website, which is vermontfamilynetwork.org. Everyone who registered for today's workshop will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording and a PDF of the presentation with live links. Vermont Family Network has been serving families of children with special health needs and disabilities and the professionals who serve them for more than 30 years. We are the federally designated Parent Training and Information Center, the Family to Family Health Information Center, and the Vermont chapter of both Family Voices and Parent to Parent USA. Today's workshop is being recorded, so please keep that in mind as you share information about your situation. This session will include live captions. If you want to turn them on, click on live transcript, then show subtitle. If you're comfortable, you're welcome to turn on your camera. You can ask questions using the chat box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. We will save time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. Feel free to share information or links to resources that you found helpful in chat as well. We know we can all learn a lot from each other. So today's workshop is Special Education Rule Changes. What does this mean for families? I'm excited to introduce you to Cami M. Naylor, a staff attorney with the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. She is a graduate of Clemson University, the University of Pennsylvania and Vermont Law School. As a former children's therapist, Cami has advocated for the needs of children and their families since long before joining Vermont Legal Aid as an attorney in 2017. She has a deep passion for protecting the rights of children and advocating within spaces where a child's needs and rights intersect. Thank you. I am going to get the presentation up on the screen for you and then we'll get started. Thank you, Karen, so much. Happy to be here today. So this session is an update. Um, in November of 2021, uh, my colleague Marilyn Mahusky provided a substantially similar um, presentation for folks. There are some things that have changed and so we're here to talk about what all of the rule changes are going to be, how they came about, and what of the anticipated changes aren't happening um, and, and what that means. So we're gonna jump right in. So first, why did the rules change? Um, <clears throat> the special education rules changed when Act 173 was passed by the Vermont legislature in 2018. The act was intended to and is intended to enhance the effectiveness, availability, and equity of services provided to all students who require additional support in Vermont schools, in Vermont schools, excuse me, Vermont's school districts. Um, the act does three things. Uh, it changes the way that funding is provided to districts from the reimbursement model to uh, a block grant funding model that will be fully implemented by 2025. Um, it changes, it requires changes to the independent school rules and it requires that schools begin to address the needs of struggling students. Um, the primary way that the act envisions addressing the needs of struggling students is through the multi-tiered systems of support in general education. Um, so, one of the questions we want to talk about or answer today is why did this act come about? Um, and the act came about for three reasons. Um, act 173 was in response to two, two, study, two independent studies and a study group requested by the legislature. The first of the two studies was out of the University of Vermont. Um, and the UVM study looked at Vermont's current special education funding model and its limitations. And that study found that the way that we were administering special education was overly costly 
for the state and, and local districts. It found that the funding structure in Vermont misaligned with policy priorities, um, particularly with regard to de delivery of the multi-tiered systems of supports and positive behavior intervention supports. So those are those uh, general education level of supports that should be available to all students. And uh, in part, what the study found was that a spectrum of supports within general education were, were not available, and especially on the behavior side. Um, it found that the reimbursement model misplaced incentives for identifying students, um, for categorizing their needs and for placing them. Uh, it found that the, the reimbursement model discouraged cost containment. So here, one of the driving factors is how is a cost effective way to support all students? Um, and finally, it found that the reimbursement model was unpredictable and lacked transparency from, um, from the localities all the way up through um, the federal funding. Uh, the other report that drove the changes in Act 173 was the District Management Group DMG report. The DMG report made five recommendations for best practices for the delivery of special education services. Pam, First, yes. We have a clarification question. Okay. Can you explain what cost containment means? Um, that was in your last slide. Yeah, so what does cost containment mean? Cost containment means um, that when we look at how the reimbursement model what the reimbursement model was costing taxpayers in the state, the, the actual costs of providing education was exponential. Um, some reasons for that are, you know, Vermont is a small state, so sometimes there's a lot of resources concentrated in, in a particular student or in a particular area, and one of the intentions and goals of providing special education services in Vermont is to do so in a cost-effective way. And so part of what this UVM study found was that the reimbursement model was not cost-effective um, and we needed to pivot to something different. The study recommended the, the block grant model um, to, do, to do two things. One, to manage the costs of educating students and to, to provide more effective access to services for all students. Um, so hopping back to the district management group report, um, they found that in providing services, core instruction um, needs to meet most the needs, the needs of most students. And so part of what that means is that students need to be receiving their core instruction in addition to interventions instead of being pulled out um, for supports and services during core instruction time. Um, to ensure students who struggle receive all instruction from highly skilled teachers, um, to create or strengthen system-wide approaches of supporting positive behavior um, based on expert support, and to provide specialized instruction from skilled and trained experts to students with the most intensive needs, right? So part of this is making sure that the most highly qualified instructors are the ones who are providing services and teaching children. And then in 2017, the Vermont legislator, legislature requested a study of the approved independent schools in Vermont that study committee was charged with making recommendations on criteria to be used by the State Board of Education for designating approved independent schools. Approved independent schools are those that are approved by the Agency of Education to receive funding for special education related services to provide those supports to students. Um, the, the group was tasked with making recommendations about enrollment, limitations on enrollment, and how independent schools required to deliver are required to deliver special education and then what disability categories. So what we know is that the study committee members um, didn't agree much. Um, what they did unanimously agree on was this. Vermont students with disabilities should be free to attend the schools that they 
their parents and their local edu education agency deem appropriate to them. Um, it's important to remember here that independent schools are already required by anti-discrimination provisions of the ADA in Section 504 to admit students with disabilities and not limit their choice to access to independent schools. Um, and one thing, if you're not aware of, that's important to know is that um, historically, this has been a problem with some of the independent schools that are quasi-public schools. So for example, in um, local educational agencies that don't have a designated high school. And finally, what Act 173 required was that the Agency of Education initiate rulemaking, right? The rules that guide um, independent schools, special education funding, and special education had to change in order for the goals of Act 173 to, to be properly implemented. Um, so the Agency of Education did that. Um, to initiate rulemaking, the agency has to draft proposed rules. They send them to the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education holds public hearings. They adopt rules. Um, once those rules are adopted by the State Board of Education, rules are sent to LCAR. Um, the rules that we're discussing today, the 2360 series, were adopted by LCAR in May of 2021 and set to implement on July 4th of 20, July 1st of 2022, excuse me. So the rules change process was pretty lengthy. Um, it took over two years. In part, the reason that the rule implementation and development process took so long was because of COVID and because of pressure by advocates put on the State Board of Education to extend time for public comment. That public comment period ran from May 2020 to December of 2020. Out of that and approved by LCAR, the major changes that affect students um, to, the, to the 2360 series rules were a change in the definition of special education, uh, a change in the definition of adverse effect, adi the addition of functional performance to the basic skills areas, the elimination of the discrepancy model for students with specific learning disabilities, and increased voice for parents. Um, you will see on this slide that there are the three major rule changes are asterisked, and here's why. Act 175, um, signed in May of 2022, delayed implementation of the eligibility rules. So the change to adverse effect, um, the addition of basic skill areas as uh, the addition of functional performance within the basic skill areas and the elimination of the discrepancy model. Um, that delay is set to set for July 1st of 2023. So the act delayed the rules by these specific rules by one year. Um, how did that happen? Uh, initially, a request for, um, for delayed implementation was requested by the Vermont Special Education Administrators Association. Um, the Agency of Education initially uh, disagreed, opposed a delayed implementation. At the very end of the legislative session, the Agency of Education um, informed the legislature that they in fact did believe that there needed to be some more time for technical assistance to help the schools be ready to bring in these changes. Um, and, and so the legislature moved forward with that delay. Um, it's, really, it's really hard and um, we know that a lot of parents are, are pretty upset by this. Um, we will be very strongly advocating uh, that the rules are delayed no longer um, after July 1st of 2023. So we are, we are already preparing um, to see if that happens and just want to assure those of you who are here today that uh, we're paying very close attention to this. We see it as a very big issue. We're taking it very seriously and um, we, uh, we're ready. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the rules that did change. So first, the 
the definition of special education. Special education was, was defined as specially designed instruction that cannot be provided within the school's standard instructional conditions or provided through the school's educational support system. Um, what does that mean? That the education should be provided at no cost to parents, that it should meet the unique needs of children with disabilities, and that it should ensure access to the general education curriculum so that children can meet educational standards applied to all children. Um, how did the rule change? Special education is now defined as specially designed instruction. Um, what does that mean? Again, and education at no cost to parents to meet the unique needs of children with disabilities, uh, to ensure access to the general curriculum so children can meet the educational standards applied to all children. What are the major differences? So the biggest difference in this rule change was the change from special education defined as specially designed instruction that's not available, otherwise available through the educational supports embedded in the general education to specially designed instruction, right? So this is the elimin elimination of the limitation that specialized instruction is not otherwise available through the general education, MTSS, um, um, EST system. And so what that does mean is that students should no longer be required to fail in the general education supports before they're provided specialized instruction or before they're able to be qualified for special education. Um, so we're gonna move on to the eligibility rule. I wanna remind you that this is one of the rules that was retained. Um, so the rule was 2362 in its entirety. Um, and what does this say and, and how do we, um, how do we get kids qualified? Um, so there are three gates to special education. A child has a disability within a disability category. Um, the disability results in adverse effect of the child's educational performance in one or more basic skill area. And the child needs special education to access and benefit from educational programs. Um, and that the support is not available through the EST or other standard instructional support systems. So one of the things that we advocated for in the rules process was the complete elimination of the adverse effect rule because of its negative impact. Um, there, we've seen so many children who need support, um, emotional support and um, social support or students with uh, on the autism spectrum or students with specific learning disabilities who are performing really well in school, who are doing really well academically um, and not functioning very well in a functional sense. Um, so although we advocated for the elimination of adverse effect, that, that was not eliminated. Um, we did accomplish initially a rule change. Again, that rule change was delayed. Um, so what we have is the old adverse effect rule. Um, that rule requires that in order to determine whether a child's disability has an adverse effect on their educational performance, the evaluation planning team must determine the student is functioning significantly below grade norms compared to peers in one or more of the basic skill areas are reflected in three of six measures over a period of time. Um, the measures that the EPT can apply are individually administered nationally normed achievement test, normed group administered achievement test, grades, curriculum based measures, criterion reference measures, or student work and or student work. The basic skill areas are oral expression, listening comprehension, written expression, basic reading skills, reading comprehension, math calculation, math reasoning, and motor skills for students who, um, and or a comparable basic skill area for students who have a sensory impairment. So what do we have? We, we have the old adverse effect rule still. Um, and, you know, we all have experienced times where that's been hard for a child to overcome. 
Um, the rule, the incoming rule says that if a child is eligible, if they have a disability, if the disability results in adverse effect on a child's educational performance in one or more basic skills areas, but it handles the basic skill areas a little bit differently and, and measuring that a little bit differently. The exception for the adverse effect applies to students who are deafblind and students with specific learning disability. Um, and then the student would be eligible if they're in need of special education. Again, the, the incoming change, so the change that hap will happen around this time next year is that um, adverse effect is becoming when a student has a negative, when the student's disability results in a negative impact in a basic skills area, that instead of that basic skills area being one basic skills area and three or more criteria and referenced measures, we're looking at the basic skill area being more than a minor hindrance um, evidenced by findings and observations based on data sources and objective assessments with uh, rep replicable results um, and the addition of functional skills included in the basic skills area. So this is the role we have to look forward to. Um, until we have this rule next year, I want to remind you that Functional performance is still within the special education rules. It's just not a basic skill area. So functional performance currently in the rules that are currently implemented uh, can be found at rule 2361.1Q. And a functional skill is the acquisition of essential and critical skills needed for a child with disabilities to learn specific daily living personal, social, and employment skills, or the skills needed to increase performance and independence at work, in school, in the home, in the community, or for leisure time, and for post-secondary or lifelong opportunities. So if you walk away from this webinar remembering only one thing, what I hope that you will remember is that even though functional skills and functional performance is not included as a basic skill area, this definition exists in the current special education rules. And so you can encourage your IEP team to talk about this um, and to address this in determining your child's eligibility. Um, functional performance, the definition of functional performance was originally adopted in Vermont um, in 2004. This definition um, has had little significance and little impact on eligibility determinations. Um, as we're coming into the next year, I think there's a lot of opportunity to advocate and remind schools like, hey, you're gonna have to look at this as a basic skill area. Um, and so just knowing that it's there, knowing that the rule is changing um, and encouraging teams to look at that as best you're able. Okay, so. Next, we have the rules for specific learning disability. This falls into um, an, a section of the rules that's titled additional procedures for identifying children with specific learning disabilities. Um, this is the retained rule, so the rule that's currently implemented. Um, this rule allows the evaluation planning team to use either the discrepancy model or a model based on whether the student responds to scientific research-based intervention. When using the discrepancy model, the districts, the districts have to find that the student exhibited one or 1.5 or greater standard deviations between the different in between the difference between their ability and their expected performance, um, and and still requires that adverse effect finding for the students. The rule that we have to look forward to again implementing next year, July first, twenty twenty three no longer permits the use of the discrepancy model so that 1.5 standard deviations or more between ability and expected performance in basic skill areas will be gone. Um, the district must determine whether the student responds to those research-based interventions um, and use the model based on other research-based procedures. Um, so what that means is that they have to apply that instruction with fidelity. They have to follow what those research-based instructions require as part of their program and that also there's no adverse effect. So you'll see that under 
the current rule, I'm going to back up just for one second. Districts can apply. They still have the choice to apply these scientific research-based interventions. And so if you have a student who is suspected of having a specific learning disability, this again is a real opportunity to advocate for and encourage your district to apply the research-based model because come next year, they're not gonna have the, the opportunity to apply the discrepancy model anymore. And again, oh, yeah, yes. Tammy, that, that is a question about um, whether or not you can give an example I think of the alternate ways of um, measuring. Sure, sure. So um, I think an example would be if the district is providing Burton-Gillingham instruction to a student and they're not responding, or um, if they're providing another sort of packaged program that has specific requirements for how you teach encoding and decoding. Um, and if a child is receiving that instruction and they're not making progress. Um, and again, the incoming rule has no adverse effect requirement for students with specific learning disabilities. And then I'm gonna send it to Karen for some discussion about the other rule changes. Okay, thanks, Cami. We're doing a quick switch of the screen sharing. But the last change I will cover, which is uh, one of the changes that was not delayed, so it is one that is already in effect, would be the parent input change. So I'd like to start off by pointing that one of the six principles of IDEA is parent and student participation in decision making. IDEA requires that parents and school personnel work together to provide children with appropriate educational services and ensures that the rights of children with disabilities and parents of such children are protected. Um, and just for definition, parents are defined as biological or adoptive parents, foster parents, a guardian authorized to act as the child's parent or authorized to make educational decisions for the child, an individual acting in the place of biological or adoptive parent, including a grandparent, step-parent, or other relative with whom the child lives, or an individual who is legally responsible for the child's welfare, or an educational surrogate parent. Next. In the commentary to federal regulations, it states that parents are free to provide input into their child's IEP through a written report if they so choose. So for parents new to the IEP process or new to Vermont, they often are surprised that there is no place to sign the IEP. They've asked, how do I show my approval or disapproval? VFN family support consultants may have advised them to send their input in writing to the team or make sure it's documented in the meeting minutes but those are not part of the IEP documents. With this rule change, parent input will be sought out and documented as part of the IEP process. Um, I'll just give you a few seconds to read this. I won't read the whole thing. So this is not meant to suggest that the parent should not have input prior to or during the IEP process. Uh, parents should be encouraged to share their thoughts, concerns, questions, and suggestions on all sections of the IEP. Next slide. So the Vermont Agency of Education has provided this example feedback template for school teams. So again, I'll just give you a couple of seconds to, to look at it. This information is also available on the Vermont Agency of Education website. Keep in mind that parent input should already be strongly represented in the present levels of performance, as that portion of the IEP forms the basis for your child's IEP goals, services, and supports. Next slide. Parents can ask that the related service of parent training and counseling be put in your child's IEP. The parent input information can help educators support you by providing needed parent training and counseling in order for you to help your child with their IEP goals 
at school and in the community. Next slide. The parent input form is a step forward in ensuring that parents are equal members of the IEP team. Parents should also know their procedural safeguards, including dispute resolution options, understand how the different parts of the IEP tie together, and to be sure to ask for accommodations if you need them in order to participate in an IEP meeting. So that does end the formal part of this presentation and um, we are into the questions and we have, we've received a couple of questions uh, prior to this presentation and I see that there are questions in the chat box. So I'll go ahead and read them and, um, and we will try our best to answer all of them. So um, this is a question from a professional when an LEA, so that's, that's the local education agency, um, advises family to go home study, to do home study when disagreeing with the virtual learning pathway, is this legal with flexible pathways? Cami, you're, yeah, you're muted. I caught that, thank you. Um, this is an interesting question. So under the IDEA, the IEP team decides a student's services, supports, accommodations, um, and time spent in the general education environment. And the LEA, the local education agency, the person acting for the LEA, um, has the exclusive right to determine the educational setting, so where that student receives their education. Um, so if there's, so the physical location, right? So if there's disagreement, Parents have the right to decide to place their children somewhere else. Um, that's known typically as a unilateral parental placement. When parents unilaterally place, their children lose the right to FAPE. If the team decides that a child should access flexible pathways and agrees the student will access FAPE in a flexible setting, I see no reason why the student shouldn't still be, wouldn't this, that student would still be entitled to FAPE. Um, I see no reason why it's, it's legal, it would be illegal for the LEA to tell a parent, well, if you don't like virtual learning, you can home study or home, homeschool your child. Um, but the parent should be aware that that's probably and very likely a parental, a unilateral parental placement, um, and that accessing a home study program will deprive their child of their right to FAPE. Um, it's, it's a little unclear from the question, um, you know, quite what the disagreement is about and whether this would qualify as a unilateral parental placement. But I think in general, if you're disagreeing with where the LEA is saying, okay, this is where we're gonna deliver services and they invite you to, well, you can just homeschool your child um, it's not illegal for them to say that to you, um, but you should understand that that's likely a unilateral parental placement and you're impacting your child's right to access FAPE. Um, I also want to just put a pin and say that anything that we discuss in the question, in the context of these questions is for, um, is for information purposes only. It is not legal advice. If you have a specific question and you'd like to seek some legal advice or you'd like help with uh, educational issues, you can obviously contact VFN or you can contact us in our, um, our contact information is in the chat box right now. Okay, another question uh, from a parent. Is it appropriate to file an administrative complaint if a school, if a child with a specific learning disability is denied eligibility based on adverse effect? I say it depends, right? The typical lawyer answer. Um, under With just this question, there really isn't enough information to say. Um, but here are some things to think about. If parents disagree with an evaluation, they have the right to ask for an independent evaluation at district expense. Now, if a parent gets an independent evaluation and comes back to the IEP team, the district only has to consider that evaluation. They don't have to give it the same weight or, or 
sort of power, if you will, as their own internal evaluation. However, if you get that independent evaluation and the district makes a decision that you disagree with or a decision that is um, not indicated in that independent evaluation, that could potentially provide the parent the evidence that they need to pursue due process to get the supports that they think their child needs. Um, if the parent, so that's, that's my subsection one. Um, number two, if the parent believes the district failed to find adverse effect and has evidence to support or show that the district should have found adverse effect and special education eligibility, then it might be possibly a good, good opportunity to file an administrative complaint. If the parent agrees their child doesn't need adverse effect and they wanted special education eligibility, but they agree with the teen's determination that there's no adverse effect. Under the current rules, I would not recommend that person file an administrative complaint. I would encourage that parent to focus their attention on working with the team to develop a robust 504 plan. 504 entitles students to special education and related services needed to access the general education curriculum as effectively as their non-disabled peers. So that parent should be considering um, working with the 504 team, getting the supports and services the child needs under a 504, and think about requesting a new initial evaluation after the rules implement next year. Um, and I just want to remind folks that administrative complaints fulfill the state complaint process under the IDEA. So um, there's a one-year limitation to complain on violations, and you're complaining about violations related to identification, evaluation, placement, or the provision of FAPE. Um, if somebody has a student who's on a 504 plan and you're concerned your child is, um, is not making progress, it's possible that you could complain in the through an administrative complaint, but that is probably something that it would have to go to due process or OCR. Okay, Cami, I think um, there is a comment here going back to your first question. Okay. Um, and Melissa, I, since you, I'll read this, but you are free to unmute yourself um, because you're pro probably the original asker of that question. So, it just says parents making unilateral placement with virt virtual learning, but schools stating they will not support the virtual learning pathway. Um, so what I take that to mean is that the district has offered something else. The parent says, no, my kid needs to attend school on a virtual platform. And so that's, that's how they're gonna access school. Um, that's still a unilateral parental placement. You're still rejecting the district's IEP placement. Your child may be entitled to equitable services, but they're not gonna be entitled to FAPE. And those equitable services would be provided through whatever mode the, um, the, I, the team determines is appropriate. So that could be tutoring or virtual services, but, um, but that's, that's a unilateral placement and your child's no longer entitled to FAPE. Okay, well, Melissa, thanks you for clarifying. But again, yeah. if anyone wants to unmute themselves, you can put your hand up and then um, we can also manage it this way. But for now, there are still some questions in chat um, as well as prior to this event. So a professional has asked, has stated that several of my families have questions about changes to paraeducated support. So I, I think then maybe the question is just, will there, is there any expectation of any change in um, paraeducator support given the changes the in the rules? Yeah, mm -hmm. so these rules don't change um, decisions that the IEP team makes related to paraeducator support. What they do do is make it possible to spread resources um, and encourage truly educating students in a less restrictive environment. Um, so for some students, that might mean that they've been receiving one-on-one -on -one para support, but really the team thinks that they should be supported in a small group environment. The flexibility of the block grant would allow that child to receive that small group support with students who don't qualify for special education related services. 
that doesn't change the fact that if the students individual that the decisions need to be made based on the students individual need and if a student needs an individual one-to-one -one, there's nothing in these rules that's going to change that um, that said the educational staffing crisis is real um, and you know we have seen certain circumstances in the last year where the team agrees that a child needs one-to-one -one support, but there are not the staff resources to provide that child one-to-one -one support. And so they're being placed in a small group or they are receiving small group support. If that is the case, um, what I would encourage parents to think about is making sure that the IEP clearly documents that the team agrees that that child needs individualized one-to-one -one support, but that the staffing's not available at this time and therefore their support is being provided in a small group. I would also encourage that team to be thinking about what are the compensatory services that are appropriate for that child not receiving their one-to-one -one support? Um, is ESY appropriate for that child um, where they may not have previously qualified for ESY? Another thing, however, to think about is that if your child is identified as needing one-to-one -one support, is receiving small group support, and is still making progress, that might be evidence that a one-to-one -one is not their least restrictive environment. And in fact, the small group support is more appropriate for them. Okay. Um, Cami, let's see. Since the federal does definition of specific learning disability does not include adverse effect, can the state and LEAs be more restrictive than the federal definition? So likewise, the state definition of a specific learning disability does not include adverse effect. Um, and it's the eligibility criteria that requires adverse effect. Um, the federal, um, it's, it's our opinion that the federal definition of adverse effect sort of means something different than the way that Vermont's currently using it, um, but that there's, we've not had a compelling case to, to really fight the, the existing, the current way that adverse effect is applied in Vermont. Um, but the, it's, it's not in the definition here either. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, this is sort of a follow up to um, the part about using the evidence based uh, measurements rather than discrepancy models. So the question is, how would parents know if the school is using that, I guess, in a, a non discrepancy model? Oh, okay. So um... Typically, there are some conversations with parents around the fact that their child is receiving some services through the EST. Um, though I, I see those conversations happening, usually parents are notified if, um, you know, a child, the team decides or the school decides that a child needs some more support under the EST. If you know your child is receiving some sort of gen ed level of additional instruction or support, um, I would encourage that parent to be involved in getting like progress reports and updates and, you know, a couple weeks in, how are they doing? Are they making progress? Or are you needing to transition to more supports? Um, so I think that in part, the parent would um, get that information be based on a discussion with the teacher or someone at the school that says, hey, we're going to provide your kid a little extra, for example, reading supports. Um, the parent can then ask, okay, well, what, what are those supports going to look like? Are you providing a specific program? Um, if the answer is yes, then I would just want to be involved in communicating with that team um, to see, or that individual, to see how the child's progressing, whether they're progressing, whether the team has determined that they need additional supports, and just doing as much information gathering as possible. Yeah, and um, just for informational purposes, the FN does intend to um, have presentations on some of the different aspects of um, special education between now and when school starts up. And one of them will be on special education evaluation. So maybe a question like that can also be um, directed to to the school psychologist who will be able to have more specificity about 
evaluations, you know, and so then the difference between the discrepancy model evaluations and the evidence-based ones. So just, just uh, stay tuned for that. We haven't scheduled it yet. Um, so the next question is who would provide parent training and counseling if it's related, if it's listed in related services, the special educator. So, you know, I, I will take that one. And it really is when a, a parent requests parent training and counseling, it would be because it is necessary um, to help the child uh, work towards their IEP goals. So depending on the topic, whether it's behavior, whether it's disability related, whether it's, um, you know, any, any specific information about the disability that the child has, it would, that would determine who should be providing the training. So perhaps it could be a special educator if we're talking about, um, say, generalizing a skill. So then perhaps they're working on a specific skill in school and you want to know, well, how can I help at home to generalize this behavior? Well, it might be the special educator. You know, it could be the SLP. It could be a therapist. Um, it really depends on what we're talking about that the parent would need to learn to help their child. Um, it is... It is a, a related service that I think is underutilized. So just keep in mind if this is something that you, you feel would benefit your child and help them work towards the IEP goals, um, you can always call our helpline too and we can sort of help you work through the, the kinks in that. Um, let me see. Another question, if a child is homeschooled, can they access the services of OTPT speech from the school? It depends. Uh, is the child who's being homeschooled qualified for special education or related services? If yes, a couple of things should be happening. Annually, the district should be making an offer of FAPE. Um, if the parent elects to continue to homeschool, that eligible child may be entitled to what's called equitable services. Um, equitable services are the funding for equitable services is decided after the district ensures that all children within the district are going to receive their FAPE services. And then if there's money left over, the, that funding is distributed between the students who are unilaterally parentally placed um, or students who are not accessing their education at school and, and taking advantage of that entitlement to FAPE. Um, for us, in some districts, that may mean no services. In some districts, that could mean a really robust package of services that's the equivalent to what the child would be getting um, if under that offer of FAPE, right? And so it depends. Um, if a child is homeschooled and you suspect your child has a disability and you think that they could qualify for special education related services, but they've not been determined eligible yet, I would encourage you to contact your district and request a child find evaluation to determine whether they're eligible, as you will have to go through the process of developing an IEP for that child. The district is required to make an offer of FAPE. Um, if you get your child eligible, you reject the FAPE offer, again, your child may be entitled to um, those equitable services. If you're homeschooling your child, you don't wanna go through the process of having them have a child find evaluation or determining their special education eligibility, you probably will not be able to access OTPT or SLP services through the school. However, if you have insurance, um, you may be able to find a private provider to, to access those services for your child. Yeah, and just another resource, BFN did host a workshop on homeschooling, and it is on our YouTube um, channel, so that's, that's some information there too about homeschooling if you um, take a look at our archived workshops. So uh, more questions are coming in. What do we know about how the block grants will be allocated? Will districts with higher needs still receive the money they need, or is there a risk of certain districts being underfunded? I'm not sure, Cami, if you if you know the answer to this one. I don't um, have a complete yeah. answer. Um, block grants are happening now. Um, there are districts that are concerned that they won't have enough funding. My understanding is that there's a process 
for districts to access more funding if they are outside of that block grant amount. Uh, the waiting studies are ongoing. Um, and so eventually the funding that districts receive will be weighted based on certain factors, um, including eligible children in the district and poverty levels in the district and things of that nature. At this time, that's not happening. Thanks. Um, if a child has SED or severe emotional disturbance, how does that change eligibility? Oh, this is a tricky one. I think it depends. Um, is that severe emotional disturbance impacting them academically enough that they meet adverse effect? Then currently is probably not impacting their eligibility. If a child is struggling with some severe emotional disturbance and it's not impacting them academically at this time, that's when I would encourage an individual to someone to, to bring up that functional performance with their team um, to, to really sort of in the eligibility conversations, flesh that out, um, get them to pay attention to that. It's possible that under these rules, a child yeah. under the, the rules that were retained, right? A child with um, severe emotional disturbance who's doing really well academically would not qualify for special education related services. Don't forget that child should still, will still qualify for a 504 plan. 504 plans are not just accommodations. Um, they can and should include special education and related services that allow that child to access that, their education. Um, but, I, but I think that it's really, it's a tricky time for kids with severe emotional disturbance if they're really high academically achieving or performing. Um, when the new rules come in, it's very likely that those children will qualify a little bit more easily. Yeah, and just related to that, we're also hoping, well, we have, um, we will be scheduling a workshop on, on form two of the special ed forms. And that does talk about how teams can look at children's functional deficits as they relate to the basic skill areas to try to help, again, give parents tools um, in that eligibility process. So we're at 1.52, that's probably time for another question. If anyone wants to either type it in chat, or like I said, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Well, Do I you can just ask... wanna pop in and say that, um, please, I wanna encourage folks not to be discouraged by the fact that functional performance is not currently included in the basic skills area. Um, I have seen districts qualify children based on a, an existing basic skills area and how they functionally perform in that area. Um, so all hope is not lost. It's just a little bit harder right now. Right. And again, that is why we, we hope to be able to do a presentation, um, basically focusing on exactly what Cammie just said, that even though functional skills are not a basic skill area, the impact of that can also be looked at when looking at eligibility. So we hope to give you some tools there, again, to help parents through that eligibility process. So you might see in the chat, there is a link to the survey that um, you know, is available if you click now, or you will also receive it after the workshop. Please do take time to fill those out. We, we do need to um, have our surveys done so that we can fulfill our reporting requirements. So thank you for all of, to all of you. Thank you, Cami, for this informative workshop. Uh, so we will have many more interesting workshops coming up, as I mentioned, one on Form 2, um, one on uh, special education evaluations, and we also plan to host a workshop on Section 504, because we also see that as a tool that parents can be using to um, help their children get services, even if they do not qualify for special education. You can find details about these on the homepage of our website, Vermont Family Network, Dot org, along with the links to all of our previously recorded um, workshops. 
you have tons of information on our website, getting connected to us is easy. You can follow us on Facebook. You can, for parents, you can join our closed Facebook page. If you are a parent, we have two closed pages, one for all parents or children with disabilities and special health needs, and one for those with adult children. You can also sign up for monthly e-news or check out our YouTube channel. We're here to help and contact us, contact DLP, you know, Cami um, by phone or email. So thank you again, everyone for attending and have a great day.